The ammonia that goes into the urea cycle uh, is primarily car carried by both glutamate and aspartate. And so this is giving just a representative example of I have an amino acid that's going to go into the TCA cycle and maybe even possibly into gluconeogenesis. And so alanine to pyruvate. And so this would be a gluconeogenic uh, pathway for alanine. And it's going to dump its amine group onto alpha-ketoglutarate and create glutamate. Another reaction that could happen is that um, an amine group could have been transferred to oxaloacetate to form aspartate. And that's actually going to happen with glutamate. Glutamate can release the nitrogen either by oxidative deamination, releasing ammonia, or through transamination, creating aspartate from, uh, from oxaloacetate. And both of those can feed into the urea cycle to create urea. Note that in the oxidative deamination, you actually form an NADPH. Just as a side note, in the cell, NADPH is primarily used for reduction, so to reduce things, and NADH, or we'll say NAD slash NADH, is used for oxidizing. So that's the, the main difference. So uh, NADP or NADPH, we can actually write it both ways. So NADP... Is you, these are used for reducing. And so whenever you look at a cell and you say, if this is used for oxidizing, meaning taking away an electron, you're usually going to find it in the plus form. Mostly is going to be in the NAD plus form so that it can strip away a hydrogen and, a pro, and, a, and electrons at the same time. And on the other hand, this is used primarily to reduce. So you're going to find most of the concentration of NAD in the in the reduced state so that it can add electron equivalents to other things in a reduction pathway. So NADP would be low, tend to be lower, whereas NADH would tend to be higher. And that's the main difference between NAD and NADP. And just as kind of an example, NAD is used to completely oxidize, used in every step in oxidizing glucose, uh, and then finally all of that uh, that um, electrons that were oxidized off of glucose are donated to the electron transport chain. And so because it's donated to the electron transport chain, that's actually a reducing job of NADH. And so even though I say it's oxidizing as its main job, it does reduce. It reduces the electron transport chain. And so this isn't an absolute term. It's just to help you remember where this is NAD is highest, typically has higher concentrations than NADH, and NADPH usually has higher concentrations than NADP. So think about the process like this. We have an amino acid in the muscle. It needs some energy, so it breaks down the amino acid, uh, removing a nitrogen group. Those nitrogens are uh, transferred uh, to an alpha-ketoglutarate, or the amine group could be transferred and form alanine. These two uh, amino acids then carry the nitrogen through the serum to the liver, where that can be released into the urea cycle, and their carbon skeletons can be, re can be used to reform glucose, which is exported back to the muscle cell. So depending on... Uh, What's, what amino acid is being broken down, whether it's forming pyruvate and adding to the glycolytic pathway or whether it's forming a TCA cycle intermediate, um, it's ultimately going to go into oxidative phosphorylation. So you have all of these pathways converging. And then over here, we've got glu uh, the amino acids going into gluconeogenesis and the urea cycle. So we have several pathways uh, converging from amino acids. In fact, this right here demonstrates the convergence of five pathways between two different organs. So let's go through really quickly what exactly happened in the muscle. So we have some glucose coming in. It's being it goes through glycolysis. So that's step two, and then uh, so we form pyruvate, which goes into the uh, citric acid cycle. We also have some proteins being broken down and through uh, to amino acids and then through transamination, uh, 
alpha keto acids are formed, which go into the TCA cycle as well. During the, the formation of alpha keto acids, the nitrogens are transferred to alpha ketoglutarate to form glutamate, and that glutamate can uh, do a couple of different things. It can transfer the nitrogen to a, to a pyruvate, forming alanine, and the alanine can then carry the nitrogen to the liver. Or, say for example, if aspartate were to transfer nitrogen to alpha ketoglutarate to form glutamate, that, that's one of these amino acids. That's a specific thing that could happen. We could have glutamate here uh, spontane could release the nitrogen, uh, which would be incorporated into glutamine and reform alpha ketoglutarate. But let me break down this a little bit better. So what happens is glutamate or glutamate dehydrogenase will release the um, the amine group. So we have glutamate, and let's say we have actually we have two glutamates, and this glutamate will be acted on by glutamate dehydrogenase to release this NH uh, two or NH three group, and you get an a production of alpha keto glutarate, so I'm just going to put alpha keto and this NH3 uh, or NH4 depending on the pH. And then the second glutamate uh, through glutamine synthase we get that second uh, glutamate we add in the nitrogen group from the first glutamate and we get uh, glutamine. And that's kind of what it's trying to show right here is that a glutamate will give up a nitrogen and a glutamate will accept that nitrogen to form glutamine. But what's confusing about this is it's not the same glutamate doing that. It's two different glutamates. Now once the glutamine has reached the liver, uh, it can either go into the liver or it can go directly to the kidney. Uh, for the kidney, why would you excrete nitrogen uh, directly from glutamine in the kidney? Well, the main reason would be during acidosis. So during acidosis, um, your body wants to conserve bicarb, and bicarb is used in the urea cycle. And so in order to conserve the bicarb, you would divert from the urea cycle and uh, instead you would you, you would just send the uh, nitrogen directly out through glutamine into the kidney. In the kidney, glutamine, glutaminase would uh, break off the amine group reforming glutamate and the amine group, the nitrogen, the ammonia would get excreted in the urine. Now, if it goes in the kidney, the first thing that's going to happen uh, glutaminase is going to release a nitrogen forming glutamate. Now that nitrogen will be a participant in the urea cycle. The other nitrogen will usually come from uh, aspartate which uh, is going to be formed if uh, whenever glutamate, so this glutamate formed, it could come down here and participate in this aspartate reaction forming aspartate from AST. So if you remember oxaloacetate and glutamate can form alpha ketoglutarate and aspartate by a transamination reaction. So that's where the second nitrogen is going to come from for the urea cycle. Now, if that glutamate wasn't used in this pathway, another pathway it could be used for is in uh, the alanine pathway. So uh, glutamate could be acted on by glutamate, glutamate dehydrogenase to release an ammonia and then a uh, forming alpha ketoglutarate then through transamination glutamate could be reformed uh, while alanine is uh, transformed into pyruvate in which case it would be gluco it would be glucogenic so pyruvate could go uh, and reform glucose which could be exported to the rest of the body so the take home is uh, Free ammonia and ammonia incorporated in aspartate are enter, are enter into the urea cycle to form uh, urea.